First of all, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you to the very first seminar in the fall schedule of the Kiyo Seminar Series. Uh, we're pleased that you were able to make it. We did have a kind of a preview seminar last a week ago Thursday that was thrown together in the last minute and was kind of outside the framework of our normal uh, series. Uh, it was co-sponsored with the Shevchenko Scientific Society uh, on uh, the home region, the history of the home, home region. Uh, in what is now Eastern Poland. Uh, before I begin uh, with an introduction of our topic and our speaker, I would just like to say a few things about uh, the fall seminar series uh, so that we're not in a rush and everybody's rushing out when I'm trying to pitch them for a thing. Uh, the um, series includes a number of interesting talks. Uh, in October, we have uh, Larissa Bielowicz, who's here, who'll be talking about... Um, Larissa, where are you? Why don't you tell us what's, your t what's the title of your talk? About the Jewish Relief Worker in Kiev during the First World War. Okay, so it's a, yeah, it's a First World War topic. In general, this is the same generation as you were going to speak today, but just a bit later. Okay, so that's going to be uh, one talk that's coming up. We uh, will be having a book launch for the next volume of the Ruszewski uh, translation series. Uh, that'll be at the uh, end of October. Uh, but also in October, we are partnering with the um, Wirth Institute uh, for uh, Austrian and Central European, East Central European Studies. Uh, we're with, on a talk by David Rechter from Oxford University, Myths, Politics, and Empire, the Jews of Habsburg, Bukovina. So we got a Jewish and Bukovina collection connection there as well. Mm -hmm. The end of October, uh, Andriy Nachowski's spouse, Helen Mitterbauer, is coming back to, uh, she's in uh, Belgium right now, she's coming back to give a talk, and they couldn't give me an exact title, but it has a Ukrainian theme as well. Uh, Sakhar Masach and the creation of the image of Galicia uh, in his writings, how he created the thing. If any of you have been to uh, Deville, you know there's a statue to Sakhar Masach, he's kind of a local character hero in the, in the, in the city. Uh, in December, Ernst Geidel, who, uh, is, who is here with us tonight, is going to be talking about anti-Semitism of Krakivsky Visti between imported and homegrown. And we also have um, uh, we're taking place here, it's kind of interesting, it's kind of a Jewish theme to the fall series overall, uh, but the Wirth Institute is, is also sponsoring uh, an exhibition, art exhibition of artwork by a woman named Natalie, Nellie Toll, and she's a survivor of the Holocaust and as a child uh, drew a series of, uh, did a series of drawings or whatever, and there's going to be an exhibit of them, and they're hoping that she's well enough to come in uh, to give a talk as well. Tonight, our... Uh, sorry, yes? Is yes. there going to be a launch of Sitko's book? Yes, that uh, that's going to be done not by us directly. We're going to do a book launch at uh, Audrey's Books. Oh. Uh, and... Um, uh, so that'll be, that's going to happen in November. We're still in negotiations. It's taken a while to put our uh, speaker series together for yeah. the fall. Yes, you forgot to mention Lyubka. Andrei Lyubka. Lyubka is another one. This is a, a writer from Zakarpatia in western Ukraine uh, who's uh, going to be in North America and he's going to come here for a reading. And that's going to be held at St. John's Institute on October 30th. So, yes, yeah. uh, so in the evening. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, those are all events you can look forward to, and I hope you come out and uh, take advantage of the great opportunity to uh, meet these people and uh, hear these presentations. Um, today, as I said, uh, our speaker today is Yuri Rachinko. He's the director for the Kharkiv-based Center for Inter-Ethnic Relations in Eastern Europe, and he is here in Edmonton doing research on a 10-week Kolaski Fellowship awarded by CIUS. The topic of his research is Andriy Melnik. Uh, and the Melnik faction of the Ogun. Uh, he's working towards a, um, a monograph, a biography of <laughs> Andriy Melnik, which will certainly be a welcome uh, addition to the literature uh, on, the, on the period, uh, because very little has actually been written about him, interestingly enough. Uh, while he is here, he's going to be using a number of collections which are housed by our university, including the Komiak, uh, 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 papers, uh, documents and, re and related re records related to Krakowski Wubisti, uh, the Boris Lovitsky uh, collection, uh, and the Hrohori Kostyuk funds, all at our university. And he hopes to make a side trip to Winnipeg uh, to work at the archives there. The, uh, 
He completed a candidate's program in Holocaust studies in December of 2012 at Karazin University in Kharkiv uh, with a dissertation titled Nazi Genocide of, Ju of Ukrainian Jews in the Military Administered Area, 1941 to 43. His research interests, interests include the history of the Holocaust, Ukrainian-Jewish relations, collaboration with Nazis in Eastern Europe, and the history of radical right movements in Europe in the 1920s to 1940s. Yuri's monograph on Hilf's Polizei, self-government in the Holocaust in Ukrainian-Russian, Belarusian borderland, motivation, identity, collective portrait, and memory, 1941-43, is being prepared for, uh, for publication. And as I said, his current project involves research on uh, Andriy Mennik. Uh, Yuri has uh, both given, uh, participated in conferences, attended workshops, taken courses uh, in a wide variety of places. I was quite impressed. You live the life of an itinerant scholar. You're in uh, Kiev, you're in Lviv, you're in Tel Aviv, you're in Moscow, you're in Oslo, you're in Munich. Moscow, no. No? Or you just <laughs> <laughs> or you no. Moscow? A few years ago, yeah. <laughs> you were there a few years ago? Yeah, yeah, a few ago. years well, yeah, ago. Okay. So not not now. All right, yeah. well, it's in, in old Moscow. No. And, um, uh, and he's been to Canada before. He was in, in Toronto as well, uh, earlier, what, two years earlier? Yeah, so the About two years ago. Yeah. So uh, please welcome Yuri. The topic uh, he's we'll be speaking on is the uh, organization of Ukrainian nationalists uh, and the activists and the uh, anti Jewish uh, violence in Kiev in 1941 to 43. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, so, good evening, dobry večer. Why in Canada it's bonsoir. Uh, thank you for coming. And be honest, it's um, so late time. I, in, uh, unexpected that it will come so much, so much people today. Um, so uh, as uh, Yars mentioned, it's my topic now. I write now. Um, uh, it's like not history of personality. It's not biography. It's like a history of movement as well. So I'm interested in such topics like um, Ukrainian-Jewish relations and uh, how actually um, members of our organization of Ukrainian nationalists under leadership of Andriy Melnik or Colonel Melnik uh, did they took part or not, not took part in the extermination of Jews during um, Nazi occupation in Ukraine. And uh, I must say, um, you know, a uh, lot of discussions actually why I am speaking today about Kiev case and Kyiv case and about uh, Ukrainian nationalist Melnikist activists in this city during Nazi occupation. Um, you know, um, it was a lot of discussions. And a year ago, when it was anniversary of uh, beginning of mass shootings in Bab and Yar uh, in Kyiv. Uh, and, and so on and so on. A lot of uh, you know, political speculations on these uh, questions and a lot of instrumentalizations and so on and so on. So I am trying to, to see it from a scientific point of view. And if you do not understand what I'm speaking about, if I speak so fast, just raise your hand, okay, hand, okay? Because I didn't speak in English for a long time, <laughs> last two, two three years. Um, so uh, among majority of ideological successors of own M, it's own Melnikites, uh, we know such strategy when uh, people do not want to write, do want to speak about participation, non-participation of these military formations in extermination of Jews, and especially in Kiev in 1941, 1943. Um, another Melnik, Melnikites memories, for instance, uh, Yaroslav Haivas, if they mention about uh, relations between Jews and uh, uh, own M activists in Kiev, they speak just about you know, some Good, good stuff. For instance, um, Yaroslav Gaivas, he wrote that uh, when he and uh, Oleg Kandiba Olzic arrived to Ukrainian capital, uh, the local Jewish woman volunteered to prepare food for them. And after when uh, it began explosions in Khrushchev and so on, uh, Gaivas and uh, Olzic, they had to move to Podol and they didn't describe the destiny of this woman, what, what has happened actually after, after this and so on. Um, so we have Russian nationalistic or pro-Kremlin uh, propagandists uh, and they in their broadcast often instrumentalize uh, the history of um, this Bukovinian Kurin, uh, this battalion in Kiev, 
and actually about all activists, own M activists in Kiev in their political um, purpose. We know, for instance, such guy like Alexander Dukov in Moscow. Um, in memory of many, uh, of some, I would say, Bukovinian Jews, uh, Bukovinian Kurin, and all uh, Melnik activists, Melnik activists in Kiev are described like uh, collaborators who actually actually in, uh, participated in the extermination of Jews. And uh, you speak about, not about narratives, because it was narratives, you know, it's how people see, how they perceive, and so on. Uh, if you speak about research, we have uh, two approaches. Uh, the first one is presented by a uh, Kievan historian, um, Vitaly Nachmanovich. Uh, he works in uh, Museum History of Kiev. And a few years ago, he wrote an article. He wrote an article about uh, Bukovinian Kurin, and uh, he states on his, his point of view that uh, Bukovin Kurin wasn't present in uh, Kiev during the beginning of mass shootings. What was the time? It's September 29, uh, 30 of 1941, uh, when Zonderkommando Fir A exterminated uh, almost uh, 33,000 of Kievan Jews. And also, uh, he d doesn't mention about cooperation between OM and Zonder Command for A, and uh, about uh, role, almost he doesn't mention about uh, Ukrainian police and its role in, in the Holocaust in Kiev. Um, another opinion, scientific opinion, it's uh, Dutch, uh, Dutch, uh, Holland uh, historian Karl Berghoff. Dutch, yeah, thanks. Um, he also, uh, his research based mostly on uh, a lot of memoirs he analyzed and so on and so on. And he stays in position that uh, at least two military formations of our own M uh, were in Kiev during the uh, beginning of mass shootings. It's uh, part of policemen from Galicia and Transcarpathian, Ukraine, under a direction of uh, Ivan Kidulich. Uh, Okay, and some another group of policemen who arrived to, to Kiev. Um, so in my research, in my presentation, a uh, few months ago I wrote um, actually one article about case of Bukovinian Kurin, and it was accepted in Zahvata uh, Zhidov in Warsaw Journal, and in a few months it will be published. If you want, you can, you can find it in, in, in read. But in my research, I am today I am speaking about and Bukovinian Kurin about uh, his participation or not participation in extermination of Jews in Kyiv. I speak about the uh, uh, role of own members who served in auxiliary police uh, and its role in, in extermination of Jews. And also I will speak about uh, own activists who served in Zonderkommando Fir A. I will say SK Fir A for A. Uh, so for, uh, it will be more simple to, to not retell at all time. So about first case, about Bukovin and Kurin. Um, so uh, in, we have a very interesting document. It's evidence of uh, Marta Zabaczynska. Marta Zabaczynska, she was a member of Bukovin and Kurin. Uh, she was a very popular, well-known activist of uh, uh, OUN-M in 1941. And um, in uh, 1948, she wrote, uh, it was in, in uh, one DP camp in Bavaria, close to Munich, uh, she wrote uh, one mail to um, Polkovnik, Polkovnik Melnik. She wrote one mail. When she, uh, this mail she described very bad ex commander chief of Bukovin and Kurin Petro Wojnowski. And uh, also, uh, it was this, this mail, it was, um, how to say, uh, few, it was mail after a few years after trial party trial, which has happened in also in, um, uh, in, in Bavaria. And uh, in this trial, uh, okay, Wojnowski said that Zabaczynska uh, um, uh, uh, had sexual relations with Banderites during, was not loyal to his man, her man, or Orest uh, Zabaczynski in, in 1941. And uh, she said in this mail that, uh, okay, activists, people who were close to Wojnowski, they uh, plundered Jewish property and uh, also um, uh, handed 
a lot of boundary rights to handle Germans as well, um, and so on. So um, this document is also interesting um, that she describes how she and her husband arrived to, to Ukraine, how did they travel. She says that um, in October 1941, I left uh, Vinnytsia and uh, she moved to Kyiv, and she met everybody and you know, all these activists. And these activists, uh, all activists in Kyiv, were, were against her. She is she, she, the enemy, and so on and so on. And this was inspiration of uh, Wojnowski, actually. And after this, she moved with her husband to Donbass. She was a few months uh, from October until February 1942. She was on Donbass. They uh, trying to build uh, own uh, some influence there. They trying to control police, sell government, but it was without any results. To be honest, uh, you know that own M activists didn't have any success, almost any success in Donbass. And she moved to Kiev, and she witnessed uh, in February 1942 how the Germans arrested and shot uh, the members of OM. At that time, arrested, uh, it were, for instance, Olena Teliha, Ivan Rohaj, and so on and so on. And also, uh, among the victims, uh, she mentioned in this letter, that uh, were a lot of people, a lot of peop uh, people close to, um, to Wojnowski, uh, who actually plundered Jew uh, Jew Jewish, Jewish, Jewish property. So what did she write, actually? I will quote. I didn't translate it. It's, it's in Ukrainian, but I think majority of, of you understand this. You know? mm -hmm. So what she, she writes uh, this, um, about, about Kyiv. Через місяць я в товариці з мого мужа виїхала на Донбас. В лютому нам пощастило живими виїхати назад. It's after this activity in, 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 uh, in uh, Stalin and this territory of Донбас. В місцях відбулися в Києві перші арешти. Із Буковинці попалося декілька людей також. Німці познаходили в них пограбовані жидівські речі і тому їх постріляли. Це, в свою чергу, зробило дуже погане враження на кращих людей куріння. Ну, буковинці курінь мається на увазі. Переважно це були креатури Петра Войновського, яким він понадавав різні пости, як організованим людям в лапках. І які в Києві тільки й діяли, що грабили. Один з них, Станкевич, вбивав постріляним жидам золоті зуби, переховувався у Петра Войновського і перетоплював їх. It's end of quote. Um, so, uh, what uh, actually we have to prove or not to prove this uh, evidence? And actually it's a question when it has happened, you know, because uh, Holocaust, did, I would say, didn't finish in autumn 1941. It was continued because Jews were exterminated during all time of, G of German occupation, two years. It's possible to, to I would say, um, about, it's possible to speak about two periods of the Holocaust in Kyiv. It's first wave, it's autumn 1941, when majority of Jews were exterminated. And um, uh, another people who actually told that they are, you know, uh, Tatars, or no Ukrainians, or Russians, or Kar Karaites, and so on and so on. They uh, survived, and uh, but Germans and uh, collaborators they continued to to hunt them. So I have uh, quite interesting another document. It's memories uh, of um, uh, one activist um, of Bukovinian Kurin who actually was also in Kyiv, it's Oris Bilak. Oris Bilak, uh, he uh, lives now in France. He's almost 100 years old, quite old man, but he, he, he lives now there. And in uh, uh, own archive in Kyiv, it's also called, uh, called people that place uh, Biblioteka Olzice, Olega Olzice, proszę. Uh, he lived his memories about activity, his Bukovinian uh, uh, activity, and so on and so on. And uh, he writes that in uh, October, 19, uh, October 1941, 28, uh, arrived to Kyiv majority of Bukovinian Kurin. It's 800 people. But before uh, did they arrive, in Kyiv was uh, so called Pochesna uh, Sotnia, Honorable Hundred of people who actually arrived before. We, we do not know why, when and so on. It's very hard to, to understand. But anyway, it was in October or the end of um, September 1941. 
And this uh, group of uh, honorable hundreds, it also, he calls these people uh, um, Ludis, Lud, Ludis uh, Horo. Uh, it's like uh, people from uh, queer, queer, and so on. Um, bless you. Yeah. Uh, and, um, yeah. Uh, so, um, in his, uh, in his, his memories, uh, he said that uh, before they arrived, these people were quite active. They sang in, on radio some Ukrainian songs and so on and so on. And what did they do in Kiev, in spite not, not to sing songs, we do not know. But let's, let, let's continue. Uh, um, uh, our research and it's also interesting very document it's a report of uh, Hans Koch uh, from October 5th 1941 you know Han Hans Koch it was quite active uh, German officer he as I remember he was in Abwehr you know, he, he changed his Stelle his position many times in 1941 and 1942 it's also quite interesting quite interesting his, his destiny in his bio to know and he was very pro-Ukrainian and in his report, he writes that uh, in Oct at the beginning of, uh, I remind, it's uh, October, beginning of October 1941, he writes that close to Kiev, on the territory of Vinitsa Heisen, a group of Promelny group, he called uh, them uh, Ukrainian refugees. Uh, it's, uh, and he writes this number of these refugees. This is, uh, at, uh, uh, he writes, uh, this is Ukrainian Flutligen aus Bukovina. So, uh, so it's like Ukrainian uh, refugees from Bukovina, and he writes a number. Number it's 300, 500 of these people. So it's close to Kiev, somewhere this group was. Uh, I, I remind you then, uh, Kiev was occupied by Germans on uh, September 19. So, to, to, uh, and it's like 30, 20, 40 kilometers to, to Kiev. Um, it also uh, pro mainly group pro mainly historian like Duda and Stark they claim they mention about hundred with, uh, with choir with ho with ho uh, horror with choir uh, who actually were on um, uh, it, it, and after after when uh, in Zhitomir were killed. Senek and Siborski, a lot of Melnikites moved to uh, moved to 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 to, um, to Zhitomir for Morin and, and so on and so on. So it also also very big meeting in uh, in, in this city. Um, anyway, to briefly to speak, I uh, will not retell any, uh, all this evidence. So my point of view, if briefly to speak, uh, if to use all. Uh, documents, all testimonies. What I have, uh, my point of view, uh, that uh, to Kiev uh, in autumn 1941, uh, it could uh, be arrived of this group, and also I have another document where um, actually um, um, th this Feldkommandantur, who actually uh, who you know, guarded you know, mass shooting place, they uh, write a request to Zhitomir to send 100 uh, policemen from this place. And I think th this group of policemen, and this is uh, choir, uh, so-called uh, honorable 100, it could be the same, uh, this is the same group, the same, the same group. Um, okay, so we go after this. Oh, if speak about police, about auxiliary, auxiliary police, uh, if speak about police, um, uh, already after the beginning of uh, Nazi occupation on September 21st, uh, to Kiev a right group of Melnikists uh, and uh, very active people, for instance, it was uh, Bogdan Onufrik, his nickname was Konik, and with detachment of 80 Cossacks. No, it was p p policemen from Zhitomir, most part of them were not own activists, they were uh, uh, ex-POW, but majority of them were probably ethnic Ukrainians who, who call themselves Ukrainian. We don't know actually uh, ex exactly their ethnicity. 
and a few uh, days after, uh, two days after, arrived the Kazakh uh, 100 under uh, c command of another uh, Melnik activist, uh, Ivan Kidulic. And six days after, on September 28, it began to work headquarters of c city police, and the first commandant of police was um, Anatoly Konkel. He was also uh, a very bad-known bad person as, as for me, but as I know, he was as well a manic activist. Uh, should, we should research his biography, as I know. And during uh, these first days, first weeks of Nazi occupation, quite active uh, in this uh, in creation of police, uh, we were this uh, O&M activists, and Petro Zakhvalinsky and Anatoly Kabaida, and above mentioned uh, Ivan Kidulich, uh, and Pe Petro Aksentiev, uh, his nickname Omelianiev, and so on and so on. For instance, Petro Zakhvalinsky, who arrived first in Kiev, uh, in the first day in, in Kiev, he was served like a chief of uh, staff, Ukrainian police, from autumn 1941 until April 1942. And in April 1942, he was arrested by Germans as Ukrainian nationalists. Uh, but later he, wa he was released, and from the uh, end of 1942, Zakhvalinsky was a commander of 2nd hundred of 115 Schutzmannschaft Battalion. And uh, he actually uh, distinguished himself uh, by participation in anti-partisan actions in Belarus. And under unspecified circumstances, he committed suicide in uh, Paris. Uh, in June of 1942, for 44, I'm sorry. It's interesting because according to official Melnikite narrative, he was killed by uh, Gestapo because his national nationalistic activity. But it's it's like a political mythologization. Uh, so all these people and Kidulich, uh, I didn't have time for this, and so on and so on. They um, actually uh, did a lot, and most part of them served uh, in different armies in between two world, uh, world wars. And uh, for instance, um, Kidulich, he served in Czechoslovak, Czechoslovak ar army, uh, and so on and so on. Um, this activist also organized meeting of the own and leading officers who were in Kiev with police uh, officers who actually sympathized to own and but didn't join uh, own. For instance, in December uh, 1941, Oksentiev organized a meeting with police commander Arsen Melnichuk. By the way, it's his uh, SS card after his certain division, SS Galicia, and if, if you want, yeah, watch, yeah, send to people. Uh, so, um, Aksentiev uh, organized meeting of uh, Melnichuk with Colonel uh, Mikola Kapustyansky. It's a well-known politician and military activist and also active uh, member of PON, you know, uh, Provit Ukrainian Nationalist. And in this conversation, Melnichuk uh, uh, with uh, this quite well-known Ukrainian politician, military figure, uh, he, they discussed actually about, uh, is it possible to establish Ukrainian state? And Kapustyansky told us it's imp impossible now because Germans against this. But in future, uh, we can do it. Uh, and Ukrainian police, it should be like a core of Ukrainian army in future. He told them this. It was the last meeting of Kapustyansky with Melnichuk, but quite uh, interesting. Um, uh, so, if we speak about mass executions of September 1941 in 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 in, uh, in, in Babiyar, it's um, all uh, people of uh, people who survived, Jewish people, actually they mentioned about so-called Ukrainian nationalists, but uh, in people who actually were executors or uh, who were guarding this place or uh, not, not shooting but staying somewhere and so on and so on, auxiliary. But uh, actually, they also also were executors. But here, it's very hard to understand to which detachments actually, uh, uh, which detachment also these people. It's very hard to understand. Um, for instance, uh, David 
Eisenberg, Eisenberg of Yiddish, uh, who survived the uh, tragedy of Babi Yar, uh, he recalls that, he, he, uh, in, he told in his interview, that uh, um, on the moment to the place of execution, near the Jewish cemetery, the guards were carrying, it's quote, uh, Ukrainian nationalists, uh, Ukrainian nationalists, he calls them, it's unique uh, ab abomination, he calls them, it's like, and, uh, and so on, which came mainly uh, with Germans to Kiev from Western Ukraine. So it's maybe because the accent, may, maybe uh, because something another. Uh, it's very hard to understand. But he calls them Ukrainian nationalists from Western Ukraine. And um, for instance, another witness, it's well known, Dina Pronicheva. She she's Holocaust survivor. She gave few a few interrogations to different trials in the Soviet Union, in West Germany, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And she. On the trial in uh, Darmstadt, in West Germany, in uh, April uh, 1968, she told that um, it was a corridor where uh, actually a few almost minutes before shooting uh, the Germans and uh, policemen uh, began, uh, they make a corridor and Jews had to go through this corridor, both sides were staying, and the Germans and collaborators, and they bet the, the Jews. And she told that in this corridor, we are staying, uh, quote, Germans, uh, German soldiers, sorry, Ukrainian nationalists, and Ukrainian police. So it's original, it's also translation, the Deutsche Soldaten, the Ukrainian Nationalisten, or the Ukrainian Polizei. So these three, three groups she, she, mentions, she mentioned. Uh, Another some uh, Jewish witness also was speaking uh, about Ukrainian, uh, about local police or Ukrainian police, uh, and so on and so on. For instance, wit uh, witness uh, Ruben or Ruben Stein or Stein, in Yiddish it's Stein. He also speaks about and calls this police Ukrainian. But interesting that he told that in this police were and Ukrainians and Russians, who he it's some difference for him, it, it, it were. Among uh, people of OUNM, if you speak about uh, Zonderkommando, SK4A, uh, it were members, um, it were members of OUN as translators who actually served in this Zonderkommando, uh, well known, and uh, of them it was, uh, it was Stepan Fedak. Stepan Fedak, he was famous uh, because he, in March of 1921, he fired to Marshal Josef Pilsudski, actually, in, in Lviv. It was an you know, attentat, but unsuccessful. And he, also, he um, worked like employer, and uh, he was employed to Zonderkommando. Uh, and after war, uh, actually, one of members of Zonderkommando, his name is uh, Johannes uh, Materna, we will speak about him a little bit later, if we will have time. He mentioned that uh, uh, St Stepan Fedak, by the way, it is also personal personal carton from Bundesarchiv in Germany. Uh, he uh, was staying on, on this road to, ba to Babiyar and controlled how Jews moved to place of ma mass shooting. He didn't shoot, it, there is no such any ev evidence, but uh, this, is, this is well known. And uh, another uh, activist of own, uh, it's a very interesting person for me, who was also joined uh, Zonder Commando, it was Alexa Babi. Alexa Babi, his nickname was Billy, his name was Ariyitz, his uh, well known. Um, organizer of uh, Melnik partisans for a few months after he joined uh, Division SS Galician, Divizia Halicina, and died in, um, in, in Battle on Brody. This is also his personal carton with photo. It's quite interesting because I have found it, his original photo, but his name here, Levchuk Petro. He came to Divizia with, with another name, but it, it's the same person. Yeah, please. So, uh, Babi also joined uh, uh, this under command in 1941. He was uh, in, in this Pohidni group, Martian group officially. And interesting, 
that um, uh, he, he was in Zhitomir and after he had to arrive to Vassil Kiev. There was Vassil Kiev with part of Zonder Commando, for A, for A, and in uh, August, on, on, on August uh, 31, uh, Zonder Commando arrested there a Martian group of Banderites. This was a group of 15, 15 uh, Banderites under leadership of Vasil Kuk. It's in future he will be the last commander chief of, of Ukrainian sergeant army, UPA. And this group was arrested and sent to Zhitomir, firstly to Bilatsark, and after to Zhitomir. And uh, there uh, Fedak interrogated them. And uh, after they were sent to Galicia, in Galicia they managed to escape. They managed to escape and they survived. It was uh, Galasa in this group, at Vasilko, and few, few, few uh, very well-known Banderites, and so on and so on. But destiny of another people were, were not so successful because in Vasilkiv, uh, Zonder Commando uh, shot uh, fr from 100 to 300 local Jews in Kovalevsky Yar. And also they shot, as I know, 80 uh, local uh, Christian women who had some mental illness because under commando they killed not only Jews, also uh, so-called mental Ill, Ill people and so on. But it's also interesting because uh, it's, it's a question, did Babi take part in these actions? And they have found one document from 1942 where uh, actually he described <laughs> what has happened to him uh, in uh, autumn 1941, and he writes in this report that in autumn uh, 1941 he was in um, in in, in Vassil Kiev. And, wh and what did he do? He actually engaged in its quote in liquidation of communists, Jews, and Banderites. The uh, Marshal liquidation of communists, Jews, and Banderites, and so on. Um, and after this. Uh, Actually, he arrived to Kiev. He arrived to Kiev, and he joined police. This is police. Uh, so I mentioned he was sent by another employer of Zonder Commando, Müller. Müller, uh, and uh, from September 22 to October 10th, he was in in in, in uh, Kiev, and, Kiev and police, and nobody knows what did he. What have he done? You know, in, in, in the, during this time, there is no document, there is no another evidence. But if we know what has happened in Vasil Kiev and what has happened later, who knows? And um, after this, uh, he um, moved to Poltava, and uh, with another activist of OM, among them were Bogdan Konek, above, above mentioned, and Yakov Kravchuk. Uh, he joined so called uh, he joined the other commando Abwehr 202 and after this he moved also to to Kharkiv and also he writes in his report uh, 1942 it was in internal report for party for own M not for publication somewhere outside he writes that uh, in Kharkiv he engaged in exposing of communist and the Jews end of quote uh, so briefly to speak, uh, it's interesting his destiny is that in 1942 he was arrested by Germans in Kremenchuk uh, and he was uh, sent to execution, but he managed to escape. So inter very, very interesting. And after he escaped to Kiev, in 1943 he moved to uh, Volinia. You know, for a few months, many guys they tried to organize. Uh, their own partisan group, but it wasn't successful. And in 1943, m some of Melnikov's partisans, they joined uh, uh, Div Divizia Sezhalachina, or uh, so-called Ukrainian Legion Samoobrony, Ukrainian Zelpschutz Legion, or it was also called 31st Div uh, SD Battalion, Ulinian Battalion, and, and so on. So it's uh, br br briefly to speak about this relation. Also, I have documents of um, um, some memories of Yaroslav Haivas and his uh, memories. He writes that he had very good relations with this about mentioned Materna, 
would uh, actually he, he was trialed in, in, in Western Germany. He was a member of Zonderkommando. And this Materna, he was very friendly to Olgic, to, Mel uh, to Melnik people in Kyiv. And also he, according to Haivas, always informed if something is ho going to happen, if somebody is going to be arrested, and so on and so on. So I think uh, this Materna, he, um, it's, it's a question, what did he done? Actually, did he in, actually in, uh, in Kyiv? But I think also he joined, he, was, he worked in SD, the High Dienst, in uh, the security ser service, which was called in popular uh, Gestapo. But it, it wasn't Gestapo, of course. And also Wojnowski, the commander chief of Bukowin and Kurin, he also mentioned that he has had very good relations with uh, another um, uh, as the activist, uh, as the employer, uh, employee uh, Müller. I think it was the same Müller who was in uh, Zonderkommando, Fear A. So uh, I have, I think, five minutes. So um, uh, coming back to to uh, to Robin. Uh, so I also have found another document. Uh, about a request of group of poly policemen uh, from Zhitomir. I mentioned that it could be you know, the same people who came. Um, and uh, I have found another evidence that uh, actually own M activists robbed uh, Jewish uh, good Jewish minority, not, not only Jewish, but also the communists, people who escaped, and so on and so on. But it was uh, well known, for instance, uh, about this writes in his letter to uh, Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky uh, in spring of 1942. Um, it's well-known activist of Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, Josep Kladochny. Josep Kladochny. And he writes that uh, in, this mem in this, his memories, it was after all the after collapse of uh, on, um, act, uh, activity in Kyiv, he writes that uh, um, when M activists became a political swindlers, and they uh, plundered everything uh, that would fall in hands directly or indirectly. So, грабували все, що потрапляло до рук, прямо чи опосередковано, everything and so on. And uh, I want to add, I have, I think, a couple minutes that uh, the Holocaust actually continued in uh, in, in Kiev and after. Uh, autumn 1941, because uh, uh, some people, some Jewish people survived, and um, actually Ukrainian or local police, because Ukrainian it's not ethnicity, it's like territory for, for Germans. It were in 1941 and 1942. The local police, Ukrainian police in Kiev, uh, continued to uh, to arrest, to catch the Jews and hand them to Germans. Sometimes they. Did it? They handed uh, uh, Jews to as there, or sometimes they killed them themselves. Or another option it could be they could send them to Seretsky um, concentration camp in in Kiev as well. And uh, in Kiev in 1941, in 1942, 1943, uh, a lot of activists of uh, uh, even after the beginning of German repressions. A lot of uh, own act activists, they stayed in their position. For instance, Kabaida, he stayed uh, in, in Kyiv, I think, until at least spring of 1943. But some, uh, some, some part of uh, uh, act uh, um, activists became uh, victims, and so on and so on. For instance, Zenon Domazar, uh, or Dibrova, his nickname, he also worked in police. But now after he was illegal, he was arrested by, Ger by Germans. He was killed in... Uh, as the prison and so on, and after World War Second, uh, after end of German occupation, uh, Soviet uh, investigation commissions they have found in prison this uh, written uh, text in uh, on the wall. that's written Dom Zen, five uh, okay, uh, five five July forty three, fifth uh, September forty three, forty three. God and Ukraine, Bokhe Ukraina. So he, he he wrote this. And so on. So, uh, but anyway, uh, anyway, uh, 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 um, in spite of these repressions, Melnikis they continue, Melnikis, they continue to uh, to cooperate with Germans. It was almost uh, to end of uh, Nazi occupation, and the, almost the last. Uh, 
Yes. I know that uh, I must to mention about the propaganda also. Because Melnikis, Melnikites, they worked uh, in newspapers, they uh, published, uh, they work on radio and so on and so on. And especially during the first months of German occupation, they have some fr 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 uh, free, free options. Uh, to, to publish what not to publish, we know about Ukrainian law, how many anti-Semitic publications were in this uh, journal. We know, uh, for instance, about uh, Volin, this journal Volin, uh, where Ola Samchuk worked, Ola Nataliha worked, and for instance, um, they published on October 5th, 1941, article about, Ki um, about what's happened in Kiev, and in this Kiev, they actually endorsed uh, murder of Jews in Bab Bab and Yar, because it was written about what they wrote about one article um, about visiting of Kiev by uh, Vladimir Kubiovich, Kospankivsky, and Vasily uh, Hlebovitsky, and uh, they wrote about activities, how created police, cell government, etc., etc., and they wrote this article. September 28th was the great day. The German authorities, having met with the burning desire of Ukrainians, Ordered, ordered all Jews who left about 150,000 in Kiev to leave the capital. End of quote. To so leave the capital, it was, you know, what does it mean? So, uh, of course, the main um, responsibility for the Holocaust, it was on the, of course, the German hands, but I think, uh, unfortunately, it's true that own M activists, even having their own problems with Germans, these repressions also played quite, I would say, important role in extermination, searching of Jews, especially during the second wave of the Holocaust after the autumn of 1941. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, questions now, yeah? Yes. Thank you, Yuri. Before I'll, uh, I just want to say a couple words that uh, you obviously had a very difficult uh, topic and a complicated topic and a controversial topic to deal with. Uh, one that requires a lot of more research, which is one of the reasons why he's mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. So um, we're looking forward to learning more. Um, one thing um, I wanted to point out, that this is a topic, of course, that in Ukraine, there's a huge discussion around the Second World War and everything that happened in the Second World War is part of the sort of Ukrainian identity of formation that is taking place. So it's all very timely. Uh, last year, of course, marked the 75th anniversary of Babin Yar. There was a big uh, conference uh, in Kiev and events. A few conferences, you know, several, yeah. Yeah, several, yeah. So, uh, and, and uh, a book was published called Baminyar Historia i Pamyet, uh, under the general editorship of Paul uh, Robert Tamaguchi, uh, and uh, it recently won first prize at the Review Forum. And in there, there's an article by Vitaly Nachmanovich, who you mentioned, and Karl Burkhoff, you also mentioned mm -hmm. about the Bukovensky coding uh, mm -hmm. and this period. So. Uh, we're looking forward to, uh, it, is, it is available now for sale, yeah. but... Um, uh, you wrote an, a review on this book. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, I did, so, yeah. Anyways, this, this, yeah. Is something, this is all part of this discussion that's going on in Ukraine, and uh, I'm very glad that we had a chance to hear um, Yuri's point of view on some of these issues. And I think we get a sense of, in the fog of war, I mean, how difficult it is to sort things out, because you've got accounts of participants that aren't really 100% true, you've got accounts of survivors that may not always be 100% accurate from their memories. You've got uh, some documents, you've got, uh, it's a lot, it's a bit, you know, the fog of war, it's, it's a very mm -hmm. confusing time. So uh, good luck in, in your continued work. Yeah. Uh, We're now able Thank to, you. to take any questions. I could go first. Yeah, of sure. course. Uh, it seems, uh, at least for me, that the main problem with your topic is the problem of sources. Mm. Uh, the actions of UNM can fit a pattern, but you don't have you don't have a solid proof that they actually were responsible for more than plundering Jewish property. And so I'm just wondering if uh, what other directions you could go with search of your sources. Uh, for example, uh, any we know that the KVG informant states stayed in Kiev during those uh, times. Do they specify mm -hmm. any partic participation, any arrival of yeah. newcomers? Hmm? On, the, on the other hand, we have those Russians, Kievan Russians, who after the war left and ended up in the West, for example, Konstantin Shtepa. Exactly, I want to say. Mm -hmm. With anti-Ukrainian mm -hmm. bias, he would be, yeah. uh, 
I was actually in the archive where his collection is housed, but I did not look into the archive. So I wonder if those two mm -hmm. potential directions yeah. you explored them. Yeah, thank you so much. Very good qu question because I also, uh, there is no time for this, but also I analyzed uh, this Russophile uh, discourse and what do they speak about nation nationalists. It also Dudin, it also uh, this from Nowe Ukrainske Slovo, Stepa, and a no, few, few of them. I have, for instance, it's very good. Uh, um, a lot of literature about this stuff, and this stored in um, New York. And this is um, Columbia University Archive, uh, yeah, Bachmetyevsky Archive, Bachmetyev Archive, a lot of these memories, and I have found, I know this discourse, uh, I know this, uh, what actually a lot of documents of NKVD were published after uh, the beginning of 2000 years. And also, they mentioned about these activities of uh, Bagazi. Bagazi, this was uh, Major, yeah, the mayor, mayor of the city, mayor, Mr. Mayor, and uh, about uh, his activity because uh, about this plundering, I have few documents. I have uh, this nationalistic uh, documents, internal documentation of all. I have uh, NKVD reports of 1942. I have German reports uh, also. It was published in all this. Is this um, in the Soviet Union? Uh, this reports from occupied territories of the Soviet Union. Um, I have uh, this evidence of Russophiles, Stepa as well. It's his uh, collection, his um, uh, interview is quite interesting in uh, Harvard collection, so called. It's, it's uh, acceptable online, so I, I analyze it as well. Of course, they uh, have some t tendencies, you know, they against, they do not like Rohai, they do not like. Uh, this all uh, origin and so on and so on, but uh, so some points of view, and also they speak about anti-Semitism. Another point of view that this is Russophiles, they do not want to speak about Russophile anti-Semitism in Kiev, because it, uh, it was anti-Semites anti from both sides, you know, uh, and uh, Ukrainian and pro-Ukrainian group of people and pro-Russian and so on and so on. So, um, I am uh, remember this quite interesting document. It's um, a diary of uh, Rostislav Zavatsky. Zavatsky. Uh, it was son of Russian white officer who actually joined um, Valonian division. It was not the division; it was battalion Valonian. And uh, after commander chief of this battalion, it was Leon de Grel, well known Belgian collaborationist. And this guy, he, uh, oh, not the grill, but uh, Zawadzki, he wrote his diary. He wrote, he wrote his diary and he, uh, he actually traveled with his battalion uh, from oh, Bela Podlaska, it's Gernal Gouvernement, to uh, Eastern Ukraine. And he was even commander chief of local police in Donbass, in Sherbinovka, Sher Sherbinovka. And he describes the Kyiv. How, how he, he was in Kyiv at the end of uh, October 1942, 41. And he was terrible anti-Semitic, anti-Ukrainian and anti-Semitic at the same time. So it's like discourse. Thank you. I hope I answered the question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I uh, start off with the defense of uh, Matthew Dukhachinska, who was accused of having sexual relations with Vandera. I quote the documents for you, yeah. yeah. Everybody knows that Vandera is pretty younger, more virile, and sexier, so who can blame her? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> just to get under the skin of all my descendants of Melnikites in the room. Uh, what you've done, and in looking through your numerous papers and research and the general direction of your writings, is you focus on uh, Ukrainian anti Semitism and Ukrainian collaboration with the Nazis. And yet, uh, and, and, and this is very similar to uh, a medical researcher talking about how many people died from a disease and uh, who may have caused the disease, but not getting to the root cause of the disease of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And I would say the disease of Ukrainophobia, which was also prevalent and prevalent among many Jews. Now, uh, if you look at the experience of Ukrainians and Jews, 
there are great similarities in why some Ukrainians may have initially wanted to collaborate with the Germans, and that was survival and the creation of an independent state. The motivation of Jews who joined the Communist Party were very well represented in the NKVD and who helped in implement the whole of the law in Ukraine, starting with Lazar <coughs> Kamilovich. Also, is similar in the sense that they were trying to survive after great discrimination against them in Tsarist Russia. So they turned to communism as a way of improving their lives, just like Ukrainians tried to create an independent state to improve their lives. So you want to hear a question? Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. getting to it. So the motives were very similar. Well, one day, yes. <laughs> And what uh, is missing in all your research is getting at the root cause and the ancient concept of divide et impera, divide and rule, and how the Russian Empire and later the Russian Empire reconstituted as the Soviet Union used this concept to drive wedges between Ukrainians and Jews and vice versa against each other. So the root cause <coughs> of a lot of the ill feeling of one group to the other has its roots in Russian imperialism, obviously in the interwar period in Western Ukraine, in Polish imperialism. And so there's a lot of similarities, and yet you don't seem to get at the root cause in any of your works, which is Russian imperialism, which still creates problems for Jews today. If you look in Donbass and how they're saying Ukraine has been taken over by the Jews, the, the, the two pseudo republics in Donbass. And so is your Press center, person. your center for interaction? Uh, I, I have found five questions, I think, so yeah. six, I don't know. Uh, yeah. 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 Given, you've given your interpretation, I don't know if you wanted to try Is to answer. Is your center for interethnic uh, relations ever going to do any research on the root causes of these two diseases and why there was this perpetual conflict between Ukrainians and Jews? No, okay. No. First of all, I don't, don't know from what to begin. You know? <laughs> First of all, I didn't want to say anything bad about Zabachinska. I, I did just quote it, you know. Uh, the document, that uh, it's her private point of view. Um, no f about these relations about Jews and the communism and Ukraine nationalism and Nazi Germany, it's, I, I think it's, it's like a speech from 1980s, you know? It's end of uh, Cold War. Cold War is over. Archives are opened. A lot of uh, possibility to search, to research the history of the Holocaust uh, historians have now, to be honest. The first of all, and if uh, that no, uh, we should not discuss it openly about what has happened during World War II. That would be, wouldn't be any any progress in the future. I think so for both and for Ukrainians and for Jews and so on and so on. Uh, I didn't understand, be honestly, your this speech about Jews joined the communism uh, and so on and so on. Ninety thirty years and about the uh, Holodomor because uh, it's well known that Jews were also victims of the, of the Holodomor and Jews were also victims of Soviet regime. It's not the point of my presentation, and they also suffer it because synagogues were closed because Hebrew, Yid, uh, Hebraic, Ivrit was prohibited in Soviet Union and so on. And after the end of ninety thirty year. Uh, also, Yiddish schools for calls and so on and so on. I don't know, what, 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 what's the point? You are speaking like Vyatrovich, I'm sorry. That if somebody speaks about Ukrainian, okay, participation of people from Ukraine in the Holocaust, it's like inspirations of Russia, Russian imperialism, or, and so on and so on. It's not. We must discuss, we uh, well, must leave this propaganda somewhere, uh, you know, in another, in other side. All right, all right. Can, can I yes. ask a question? Just, and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but... Um, do you, do you happen to know what the Jewish population of Kiev was in 19, the summer of 1941? And how many Jews actually were managed to get evacuated? Because basically, a part of the population huh. managed to escape uh, uh, 
because they were evacuated. I guess they were like mm -hmm. who were in important positions and whatever. Had it's a good, it's a good, good question. Yeah, uh, be honest, uh, let's open a book by uh, Karel Berkhoff. He writes about these numbers. I don't remember where it would page, but he 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 does, he does it. As I remember, uh, this Jewish population before war, before uh, uh, June 22, yeah, 22nd yeah. of 1941, it was close to 115,000 uh, Jews. Okay. But as I remember, majority of them had some options to evacuation. Not all of them, but an key of how many Jews stayed there. We have only the number of this in one. Uh, Einsatzgruppe, uh, Sonderkommando 4A, report uh, of the beginning of October 1941, how many Jews were exterminated in Babi Yar there. So it's 333,000 Jews and 771. So it's according to this report, how many killed. And how many they were killed in, in Babi Yar after and so on and so on. It's, it's statistic, you know, it's very huge discussions if uh, you open yeah, this yeah. book. So yeah, yeah, so uh, I okay, don't know. No, yes. imperfectly understood a lot of what she was saying because I, I just don't have that amount of detail in my own memory bank. But That's my pronunciation as well. activists who arrived in Cave along with the Germans, some from Bukovina, some from Halachanai, some these mm -hmm. Melnikites. Were there any Banderites that came in with, with those, among those activists? That, what was the role of the Banderites? Because you mentioned that mm -hmm. some had been killed. Mm -hmm. By whom? Arrest, arrest, okay. yeah. So just if you could yeah. locate the Banderites in this yeah. couple of months. Is there? They, yeah, they were there, and uh, actually, it's, I mentioned this about this Vasil Cook's group, which were arrested and uh, was held by many many guys in, in, in um, not so far from from Kiev in Vasil Kiev, and it were group. Uh, it's very hard to find out how many were uh, Banderites there, but sure, in Kiev it was uh, Dmitro Moron Orlik, this well-known activist of Bandera movement in in, in, in Kiev. And uh, maybe a few hundreds, few maybe dozens of Banderites also were there, but uh, they, they didn't have such success, I would say, like Melnikites had for a few months. You know, they didn't control uh, police, they didn't control uh, or didn't send successfully their people to self-government. And uh, you know what destiny was of Dmitro Maron Orlik. He was killed in, uh, in June 1942 in, 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 uh, in, in Kiev. And it's a question with help of whom and so on and so on. So maybe maybe Malachi's help, I don't know, at that time. So it was... So were, they, were they already, they were, K, they were residents of Kiev? Did they come no, it was we, we people, uh, we people mostly who came, who came from, from uh, Western Ukraine, majority of them, as I remember. So. Uh, we should, uh, uh, and, uh, and also, uh, many of them were killed in, in prison. In this prison, um, uh, it's Korlenko 33. It's now it's uh, SBU. It's now it's staying there, ex KGB uh, <laughs> building. Uh, by the way, there is no uh, in this prison were killed in Jews and uh, Banderites and some Melnikites and Teliha was killed there. By the way, not in Babiyar, but there, Babiyar. And there is no any information on this prison now. Awesome. I, I have a suggestion that would, I think uh, I certainly would find useful because uh, this history is so complicated and confusing that I think it'd be very helpful to have a chronology, just a straight chronology mm -hmm. of event, date, source, mm -hmm. uh, because to, you, that you can correlate because the sequence of events here is very important. Mm -hmm. And then also the source of the information, you know, is it uh, contemporaneous or is it uh, things yeah. or the document or, or whatever that that would help to make sense of it because I mean trying to absorb uh, you know your your uh, interpretations and everything like that is tough mm -hmm. without having a clear sort of uh, chronology yeah chronology of yeah this, you know, I'm that might be, anyway just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I am trying to rewrite a little bit my article about Bukovinian Kurin, which is going to be published in, in uh, Zahwada Zhidov. And actually, I try to add here information also about police and the Einsatzgruppe and so on. So it's like I'm uh, how to say in German Überschreiben. I'm trying to rewrite it, this article and uh, do it bigger, maybe one day. If there aren't any more, let us know. Чи ви маєте, чи ви вважаєте, що мельники і його соратники мали скільки-небудь 
Okay, also in, in Ukrainian I think so. Uh, uh, okay, in Ukrainian yes. So in uh, one question. Да, дуже дякую. Дозволи. Політика мельниківців щодо німців була. Тут треба все-таки розняти. Саме мельники персональність чи... Мені здається, що ні. Тобто мельник фактично весь час війни, 40... радянсько-німецького мається на лазі війни, сидів в Берліні. Тобто з літа 41-го року. Він просто перебував. Я можу сказати, що я можу сказати. Окей, для тебе. <coughs> so all time, uh, after the beginning of Soviet-German war, uh, Melnik he was staying all time in 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 in, in Kiev. Uh, sorry, in, in Berlin, and he didn't visit uh, Ukraine. But the point is that he knew almost everything what is happening in in uh, in Nazi-occupied Ukraine, because uh, Olzhis visited him a few times before his. Arrest and de death in uh, Katset, Sachsenhausen, and another people. He knows about the rest of the Liga and so and so on. And uh, as for me, uh, all this time, he was against any anti-German actions. All time, if people in land in cry, uh, for instance, uh, such guy like Babi. On his position, he was quite uh, anti-Semitic and so on. So, but he understands that. They should do anything against Germans because they will lose all support of, of Ukrainian people. Because in 1943, to be in Heist Commissariat Ukraine and do not fight anything against German occupation, against Erich Koch, it was no, impossible. You know, because in many aspects, Banderites, they begin to use this anti German slogans at the beginning of 1942. They, uh, they, you know, they receive all the support of people actually, you know, part of support on Ukraine. And I think just because uh, Melnikas, they didn't push any anti-German slogan, even after arrest of Melnik. It's interesting because I have seen one uh, leaflet, own M leaflet. It's May, I think, or April 1944, you can imagine. So it's a few weeks before arrest of Olzic. Uh, Melnik, he was Eren, um, Hefank, how to say, Pochesny uh, arrest. He was під почесним арештом, значить, здається, не в Берліні, кудись його до Альп перевезли, щось таке. And so on, and he, uh, this, is, uh, this leaflet and this information, so, our uh, leader, наш вождь, is arrested, Мельник, uh, хай живе українська національна революція. That's it. Слеба Україна ще фольксі революціонна. That's it. No any anti-German slogan, you can imagine. And uh, it, it was his position, but a lot of people <coughs> were for a beginning of resistance, yeah, and, and, and cry, but he was this suspects like conformist, I would say. <coughs> uh, just one, one very short question. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, a number of Melnikites actually uh, uh, arrived um, in Kiev, not just uh, in the, not just a part of Kuri, uh -huh. but also as uh, translation officers for German for the Wehrmacht. And um, I also was looking into the history of uh, Manic Organization. It's a uh, kind of general remark that those of them who served under Abwehr, under military intelligence, usually survived the war quite well. And mm -hmm. one of them was Marko Antonovich. Mm -hmm. was yes, I wanted to. Uh, mm -hmm. Intelligent uh, uh, mm -hmm. nationalist and human being in general. I read his letters. And he at that time was also, I'm not, I'm not sure if he was in Kiev. He was. He was. Uh, he mm -hmm. was generally in that area. Mm -hmm. This archive is also available and open, mm -hmm. so I wonder if you had a chance to look into this. Yes, I did. I, 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 um, it was published his interview for Ukrainian Canadian yeah, research documentation. Yeah, yes, in Ukraine Moderna, he, he was in Kiev, he describes, this, by the way, also robber and of Jews. Um, he, he spoke with two Melnikites. Um, who actually follow, I have to say, his, uh, they followed, they, uh, they guard the Jews to, to, ba to, ba to Bab and Yar, and mm -hmm. according to his, you know, point of view. These Jews gave to this policeman their, you know, earrings, some, some gold you know, rings and so on and so on. But I do not believe that these Jews uh, gave this stuff, uh, how to say, Dobrovilno, yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah I, I do not believe in this uh, stuff. It's like narrative and so on. Uh, yeah, it would, would be, could be about number. It's also quite uh, complicated because, um, do you know this official uh, Melnikite uh, Melnik narrative about 700, 
21 Melnikis who were perished in Kiev. In, 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 it's official, it's, it's, it's written, it's, it's narrative, and this narrative is terrible, accepted in Ukraine, no, almost by officials, you know. I see time, but this is no no documents, no proof of this time of this, of this document. Also, is there exists another number of victims in at Bab and Yar. This is in this cross on a cross in Bab Yar. It's number of uh, names is written there. You know, it's uh, 61 name mentioned. And uh, I and my colleague Andrei Usaich, we searched more and Andrei searches this, and we have a, have found information about four at least of these people who were not victims of Nazis in Kiev. That's sure. Somebody was was killed on Western East Front in uh, Wehrmacht uniform and so on. So it's like statistics. It's quite interesting. <laughs>